Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. There's a series on our hands, uh, the pun that never dies. Uh, <laughs> we are back to us on the cast desk, just getting Maple a chance to sort out some tech issues. It's been amazing having on the desk, but sometimes your PC just doesn't want to behave. No, and sometimes uh, you can try and rail against things all you want, but uh, it is a foregone conclusion. That's kind of what it felt like for V3 in that last game, because they lost the early skirmish this time. Even in game one, they ended up getting themselves, you know, that first blood, and they, they ended up playing around that. Since they didn't get that, since nothing really in the word I keep using is stabilized for them, they didn't really get to roll into the mid game with any sort of lead. And against a team like the AFM, they will take you on an even fight every day of the week. Standard drafts, Arya gets a lead, and the problem is he takes that lead and breaks a game with it. Stats are on screen, and uh, yeah, that is a full 11,000 more damage than Victor. That it is, because while Syndra doesn't do great into tanks, Volibear, Tom, Kench, all of our HP stackers, they don't necessarily get to that insane level of tankiness that something like a Scion gets to, uh, which can often just nullify that champion's impact. Ari got the early lead, the frontline couldn't stand and fight, the Victor and the Senna therefore really had nothing to work around in those team fights because even the Devour was being used to bail out Mujin, to bail out Cog. Uh, indeed, and you can see the difference in both the mid and AD carry rolls. Utapon gets uh, gets go donated a couple kills later on. He starts running over the game a little bit as well, and at that point, the damage duo of Syndra and Kaiser pretty much unstoppable throughout this game. That they were. So now a game it, it, again. It comes back to V3. Every single game has been a stomp so far. I think V3's game has been the stompiest of them so far. Can they reprise that game again in game four? Doesn't matter how they do it, they need a win or they are gone. DFM will be champions with another win. Last summer in the finals, DFM made that lower bracket run. They made it to two and one up in that series. And then V3 won back to back in games of four and five. That was the bat off the back of Ace Zoe. From what Joshua was saying, and well, I mean, I think it's kind of a concurrent opinion amongst all of us here you can't give a skill matchup between aria and ace we've known that since spring of 2020 mm -hmm. hell we saw that so many times between these two players we saw v3 going on stuff like set mid clear roam karma mid similar thing just shield stay safe and just have a non-interactive laning phase if you give them a skill matchup well that's what happens in that last game you just tend to get outperformed but that's no real slide against ace aria is just that good he really is an ace Probably needs to find a way to link up with Mujin and get out to one of those side lanes and get him rolling. Cog Cog got a bit of an advantage on the volley bear, but couldn't really get it to stick. Partly because Ebi did a decent job of, of, of playing triage and stopping the bleeding. And also because DFM were quicker to the roam to top, just as they were quicker to the roam to bot lane. You know, the teleports were a little late for V3 in the bot lane. They were certainly not for DFM. They were a little quicker to the play in top and they turn up in a 3v2 because Victor teleports in and has a horrible time there as well. Oh, they did, and it just kind of felt like every time V3 went for a reactive play, uh, they just didn't get anything out of it. They teleported the play and got nothing. And that seems to be the story of the entirety of the early game plays. And it's another thing that that, that, that thread we keep pulling on and unraveling um, this tapestry of narratives. DFM, if they, they have just been the proactive team more often than not. Yes, in that second game, uh, V3 made a lot more proactive games, particularly Mujin just ran through the battle lines of DFM and nothing really could stop him. I mean, in most of these games, it has been DFM making the plays which lost them the game mm. rather than V3 kind of handing it to them instead. Absolutely, and uh, also some credit over to DFM, coaching staff, Steel. Big change in the jungle pathing priorities. Screw getting level four. Screw that. Pressure bot lane. Yeah, you know what? Well, you know, just screw trying to, you know, go for full clear. Just turn up, be there before Mujin can, because he's done it every single damn game. He has not changed it. It's how he decides to beat the Hecarim. And if you don't give him that option, you turn up with your teleports, you turn out you win it. Yeah, well. and, and credit to DFM, particularly for this game, getting slapped like that in game two when V3 could have dispelled their demons there, because they, of course, they beat the DFM organization that last summer. Very mm. different lineup. Only Ace and Ryan are retained from that last roster. But Cog Cog, his first win against Ebi as a player since 2016, his first win against DFM 
ever, as far as I'm aware. Oh no, he's, he did end up winning again back in 2016, although I think that was back in spring, not mm -hmm. summer. Um, but it's been, you know, a good five years at this point since Kokog had landed those victories against those the, in those two metrics. He's finally done that. But DFM have not let that kind of capitulate, not let that roll into too much smugness or overconfidence for V3, which might uh, have propelled them to a victory in that third game. V3 have to reset again. I would assume they're going to go back towards blue side. Got to show us what they've got. Of course, blue side has won every game thus far this series, and there uh, might be a problem again this time out for DFM. We'll see whether they can get a win on red side. They did it game four versus Rascal. Jesters, um, but that was with a very different. I'm oh, sorry, they didn't do it game four. They did it. I can't remember when they did it. Either way, um, <laughs> they uh, managed to force that because the answer all came so, in set first round. So actually, I apologise. I was giving you false information. Either mm. way, uh, the point being that actually maybe. Do that. <laughs> Apparently, me. I'm a bad human being. Uh, it's the reason I'm a host in the play-by-play. -play. At least you're a pretty good caster. We'll deal with the hum We'll deal with the human thing a bit later. But that one's okay. <laughs> Thank you for the vote of confidence, question mark. It's all you're getting from me today. <laughs> that, that's fair. I've been rude enough. Um, this is coming from the man who's literally in permanent marker written series on his hands. So, um, that was a permanent. Unlucky dude. Uh, <laughs> see that in a few weeks. So I'm sure there'll be photo evidence. Um, either way, it is now at match point. Rascal, no, Rascal Justice. Uh, V3 Esports find themselves in a difficult position, but they are on the blue side, which has proven very powerful. No. And... I, I need to see whether DFM have got something on red side to, to match up against this. <laughs> as much as this is a bit of a snafu, it's like, oh, Rascal Justice, but we expected Rascal Justice to make it to the finals. That was how good they were. For V3 to make this lower bracket run, to go into this series and be like, no, we are contenders. We are worthy to be on the stage. Take a game off of DFM in the fashion that they did. It really goes to show how much work and improvement has gone into this team. And that this this uh, this 2020 run from them wasn't just a fluke of the roster that they put together. The org and the players that have remained are definitely up there as valuable assets to the LGL as a region and can up the level of this and maybe even take this title still. DFM win this game. They become the champions. They go to MSI in Iceland. They take Aria to an international tournament. It will not be the full Exodia come summer. But the fact that they are winning the spring split without their primary roster should terrify the LJL. The V3 Esports will look to stall out the Dark Lord rising here. They'll look to bring down the Demon King before he can fully complete, or it can fully complete. Let's be completely uh, neutral on that front. And they're not out of this series yet. They've shown they can win. They even fought pretty well in game one. Game three was a lot more of a shutout. They didn't really have much of an option in there at all. This could get difficult. They're not out of this series yet, but I think part of the problem we were having on the analyst desk was saying, well, look, this is this is just a standard draft. There's nothing scary here yeah, for either team. So and they still don't get anything. I, I mean, I think that this time DFM are not going to give Nar on blue side. Mm. I think they just say, you know, screw it, ban it away. And if they do, I don't want to see the Gragas into it. Evie plays so many more champions than that. Yes, Evie is a good Gragas player, but we have seen so many things from him, and that is not really uh, the pick which bullies around that pick which Cog Cog is so good about. We are into pick and ban phase, and we're going to oh. have to see if DFM are going to ban away that knock. The Nocturne is the first ban. They had one game of that. They didn't want to deal with it. The Paranoia was really frustrating for them. They ban away the Renekton as well. Of course, Nocturne is a flex between jungle and top. Renekton is just something that Arya is very good at, so just getting rid of it. It's still very... Very similar bands here for DFM. Udia taken as well. Will we see either Seraphine or Nar get through? <laughs> Seraphine is left open. See whether that now gets picked up here. Very good point. So I think oh. now that the Jinx is locked in, I think you go something like that uh, Seraphine Thresh maybe, but that of course locks out that Thresh from that bot lane. Question is, do you want to risk giving the Enchanter plus Jinx combo? Very, very dangerous from DFM. They've had to throw down that gauntlet, though. You have had to let a couple of those power picks through on red side. There's the Seraphine. Get ready to get your dancing shoes on. The show is here. Hecarim's looking to be the herald of that exactly. Uh, Aria, in particular, has been the one who's turned really gone towards that Seraphine and has two put out wins. some... Two, two games, two wins. 37 KDA on the Seraphine. Hot damn. That is fairly impressive. He has barely died at all on the champion. I think I've seen him die once overall. He's only been given it just the once or just the <laughs> twice. 
And uh, it does get scary. Hecarim plus Seraphine is a deadly combo. We were talking with Maple Street saying, yeah, well, Shen and Hecarim has kind of been replaced by Seraphine and Hecarim. The combo is still pretty brutal. Oh. It's pretty strong. They'll take away the Olaf, which is, of course, as we said, is Mujin's response into it. It really didn't work out that well last game, though. So TF into the Seraphine. TF actually can get a little bit bullied around by the Seraphine, um, particularly when you do have a player like Arya on it. Arya has gone 6 0 and 16 and 8 1 and 7 on this pick. So it's not even like he's lacking for kills on it either. This is a strong mid jungle TV2 from the side of E3 and one that DFM hopefully will realize they have to sit on for a little while. You don't really want to be tangling with that early. And the Ezreal makes his first appearance in this series. You can outrange the Jinx with this, disengage from the Olaf. In fact, actually back in spring 2020, when Sangoku started to pick up the Olaf uh, on, on blank and was such a power pick around that, DFM picked Ezreal out of meta. That was when we really saw the start of the return of it, mm. just before Ezreal came back with the Iceborne Death's Dance meta. You know, Utapon's going back to it. It's been a while since we've seen it, since that Rascal Jester series and that Juggernaut match. He's back to it now. Support bans now coming through from DFM. The things that will help support the Jinx. I imagine either a Tom Kench or a Brawn ban would make a lot of sense here. Or perhaps you just take one of those away as well if you're uh, feeling confident on Kazu's side. Just make sure, the Jinx, <laughs> uh, make sure Jinx has a tough time staying alive. Brawn is the answer. Reiner has put a lot of time into Brawn in the past, so I can understand the option there. Yeah, and it also gives you a lot of kill pressure in lane. A single Q is uh, all it takes, or a flash auto. Reiner played very well around it against the Rascal Jesters. I think that came out twice in that series mm -hmm. overall. So now the question is, what have you got to protect the Jinx? Of course there is that Tom Kench, but as we saw, if you start losing your frontline efficacy in those fights, sometimes you need to use the Devour on them. That makes you feel a lot worse about things. Indeed it does. Urgot again, last ban out from uh, V3, just to make sure that was on the cards for everybody who's aware. Set being debated here, it's a way to force your way through and try and get to well, the Jinx potentially. And... But you can still flex it, right? This can still be a flex mm -hmm. between, well, I mean, there is the chance that Arya could take it in mid. It is very unlikely. It takes that pick away from uh, Reiner if you wanted to pick that up too. What this means is that if you pick something like a Scion, less likely the Volley Bear, it means your front to back with a hyper tank front line is much less effective because when you play Scion into set, you just get dunked into your back line and the Jinx has nothing more to say about it. With the Volley Bear locked in to that top lane, looks like it's likely to be the set in that support role now. Okay, so we're expecting set support as being the option. There's still where we go. Seraphine support, set top, something else mid. Like there, there is some flexibility here. Little less so for V3. They'll lock in Leona last to join in with the Olaf and the Volley Bear going in. A lot of pick and some decent front line to uh, shield the Jinx, but no way really to keep her safe if people dive on her. No, not indeed. So, I mean, at this point, you're looking at this top lane matchup. You could, again, go back to something like it your... is. Okay, no, it's not going to be the Alistair into that bot lane. It's going to be the Cho'Gath top lane, Hyper Tank from DFM. We've seen what happens when Cho'Gath gets chomping on champions. That is a hyper tank to play around. We're expecting set support, Cho'Gath top, Seraphine mid, unless some shenanigans come through, which I suppose is always possible. But flash feast onto Jinx would make Jinx real sad in this game. Exactly, and we saw Cho'Gath into this combination back in spring when it started turning up. Is that Jinx, Lissandra? Pop off with the first kill because Lissandra can just lock them down for forever. Come, because Chogaz would just delete your, uh, your your carry while they're in the process of doing it. A single rupture can tell the story of this game. On the side of E3, what do they have? A fire cannon gold card is the closest thing you get to it. Not nearly as threatening in my eyes, though, as that Chogath landing a multi-man knockout. Of course, you do have some very extended CC chains onto individual targets. Zenith Blade into Solar Flare, into uh, Everfrost from TF, into Gold Card from TF. You can keep somebody locked down from DFM for a very, very long time. I would expect to see uh, Utapon running with the cleanse, I think, mm. on Ezreal. There's just so much CC he here that I think yeah. he needs to kind of avoid Thundering Smash, uh, Zenith Blade, Shield of Daybreak, Solar Flare, <laughs> Gold Cards. You know, that's <laughs> a lot of pick CC, which would make Ezreal's life very difficult. That it would. And I have to say, this is the kind of game where you look at that Twisted Faint and you wish, 
You know what? I wish we'd saved that for a Silas later on, but Ace is just not really that kind of player. If this had happened in another region where you did have a bit more of a wide champion oh, Silas in this game, mm -hmm. Silas with uh, the ability to have effectively the AP one shot from uh, either the Hecarim or the, the Seraphine or the Shogun <laughs> would have been huge. Anyway, not to be had in this game. He didn't want to blind pick it in towards that top lane for Cog Cog. So. Potentially the last game of the day. It is game four. It is DFM looking to seal themselves a championship. Game on. This could be it. We are loading onto the rift. What could potentially be the last time? V3's backs are against the wall. They get Ace on a matchup that does not have to hang around mid lane. They get Hollow onto the Jinx. It helped out very much against the likes of Sol, against the likes of Gango. He's going to have to do it against Utapon, though. And Utapon's Ezreal is a thing of beauty. That it is. And, well, one of the problems V3 are going to have in this game is how do you close down Utapon? It is effectively on Reiner, uh, because you have that cleanse... Uh, from Ace with that gold card, but he's outranged most of the time by Ezreal just throwing those Qs out. I have to see what the bill will be coming in from Utapon. Of course, he can go towards better tank killing options, stuff like the Kraken Slayer as your uh, mythic item third. I'm unlikely to see that for quite a while in this game, though. And for once, we do not have top side starts from both junglers. Steel is starting on his blue buff and passing towards the top lane. That he is. So... What that means is uh, maybe DFM feeling a little more confident in that 2v2. The three, though, have themselves priority in the bot lane. Kazu not going to get stunned on that one, but they are going to be zoned off of one melee minion of, um, so yeah, of experience, more importantly. There is the shield of daybreak. A start from Reiner, who just uses it to whack Kazu in the face. I do not know what ability Kazu has started yet. I imagine Facebreaker would be the He has the Aftershock, so he's probably gone for uh, the Facebreaker, and that's an important adaptation because Kazu... Realizes when you have a gold card, when you have yourself uh, the the Leona coming across strong with all the forms of CC, maybe the Aftershock is the thing which makes you more survivable than the Phase Rush, because if you're going to get stunned, you may as well have some extra resistances while you're doing that. That's a fairly big AI advantage. Mujin did go in, having taken his blue buff to steal away Steel's Raptor Camp, and we'll get a hold of that pretty quickly. Just went to make sure that Mujin wasn't on his Krugs, which I think was exceptionally wise. And we'll be interested to get everything but those raptors, which is a bit of a frustration, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, so Ebi uh, on this Chogath, much harder to displace from the lane again in the compared to a lot of different top laners. Has that sustained passive, not unlike Gragas, where you just start farming that wave with your abilities. And uh, set, and sorry, not the set, but of course the Volley Bear struggles really to do much after that point. Steel is on that top side. Mujin trying to, uh, of course... Um, takes take some camps away from the Hecarim once again. Yeah. Again, having some problems with just the stream and the feed from the official stream. Spare was very, very quickly. Don't think we're going to see quite so much action right now based on the positions of those junglers. Unless, of course, still gets a bit frisky towards that top lane. Yet to see that happen, though. Less action in this early game so far. Yeah, stable early game sounds pretty okay for both teams. You know, you could see that V3 would love to hit over to... Uh, that kind of level 6 mark, get Ace able to gate out of danger. Whereas uh, DFM kind of probably want to hit level 6 as well, honestly, on things like the Hecarim, or things like the Cho'Gath particularly. Mm. We love that level absolutely, 6. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we are back into oh, game wow. just as the 2v2 starts. Oh, Reiner goes in but sets up for a horrific face breaker. Hollow now flashing in, but the face breaker is there. First blood to Ezreal and for once, Kazu is not the one that oversteps. It's Reiner who goes in and sets for, for the picture. Perfect face breaker. And I know that Sol got the first all pro team from the LJL. I think that he is maybe even the MVP of this. Oh, yeah, because he's of, been super. Just because of how valuable he was to Rascal Jesses as a team. But Utapon threads the W past Reiner, who's diving in, immediately goes on to Hollow. The turnaround from Utapon was timely, it was perfect, it gets them the kill. 2v2 advantage to the FM. Utapon, what a star. We call it the duality of Kazu, and this is when it turns up heads. A little bit of assistance from Rhino going a little deep on the yeah, Leona. So, yeah. Watch this again. I really want to watch it. I mean, oh. the, the problem is, when you use that uh, that E, the Zenith Blade, you do get pulled just beyond the enemy target, which means that the Face Breaker actually gets the stun instead of just the damage and the displacement. That's the first thing. W lands, gets weaved through that Essence Flux, and Utapon gets to punish with that. Ebi now in danger on that top side, and uh, we'll have to see what's happening with the response from 
from DFM. Thundering Smash comes through, the Rupture is there, flash away, and now they get silenced under tower, and that's always a risk with going into a Cho'Gath. That was actually super dangerous, because people forget about the slow that comes out from the extra bits of CC coming from Cho'Gath. That could have been one more tower shot, could have been death for CogCog. Ebby loses the flash, outplays the dive though, gets the stick around Steel's and top lane long enough for Steel to cover his recall. Uh, it does indeed. Vorpal spikes coming out, and that feral scream nearly sealed a kill for Ebby. He'll be down a little bit of CS, but that's kind of Volley Bear early on. He's pretty dangerous at that point, and as long as Ebby is staying alive on the weak side, he's feeling pretty happy. Uh, he is. Uh, th th he's on the weak side of the Force uh, this game, uh, <laughs> much more aligned with the, the Jedi and that one. So Darth Cogcog looking to make this uh, this Volley Bear more impactful than it was in that last game. And he's going to have to make it something like that. He's just used his teleport back to that top lane. No chance to really impact this bot lane. The bot lane is losing that 2v2. Lost that kill. At least they're not falling behind in CS though. They are not. Ebby is not teleporting back to lane. He's going to seed this wave just so he has the teleport available to get elsewhere on the map. He does. And uh, so Cogcog at least getting themselves some plates. And I mean, given how Ebby has been the winning player in LGL history. He was on the Rampage rosters, which won outside of DFM, and then was on most of the DFM rosters, which have won too. Oh, heavy. Winning in this 1v1 is so important for V3. It means that this series has not been a foregone conclusion. He is more than just a cog in the machine. He is a cog cog in the top lane, taking it directly to Abby. Abby didn't teleport back, and cog cog punishes his decision there, because he cannot get to the safety of his tower. He's caught out between <laughs> lanes. He's nowhere near the experience, just loses that that whole wave to tower. The rupture is there, but he's not level oh, six. Not he hit. doesn't have an option. So Steel and Ario coming out. up, but I don't think it's going to get too much. No, it won't. You have the TF vault now. He has an ignite. You can't really tangle with this G this this uh, top side of V3. At least DFM are not taking losing fights whilst they're losing this top side of the map. Yeah, hasn't compounded their issues much like Ebby when he was on that Shen in game two happened to be right. And having this happen against Ebby, like we were saying, for so long it was just the question of do you have Ebby on your team? Do you want to win the championship? If yes, then you will win that championship. That changed last summer. Ebby lost to V3. And in this game, Kalkok has been a force to be reckoned with on the NAR, which has been banned away from both of these guys. Now, Ebby's going to have to outplay the dive yet again. He is, but everybody from DFM is coming up. If you can buy time, he can do a lot of work. Just needs to get a feast down or something. Gets a decent knockup, but now the rest of the DFM squad here. Mujin has got flash, but he's going to need to use it really well. The fear is there, and Mujin will fall down in trade for taking Ebby's life. That we will do. Well, I mean, he's still running right now. Kill goes to steal. Double buffs refreshed. It is a good kill. It's not going to be the kill onto Cogcog on the Volume. He doesn't have the teleport either, though. And killing a jungler is often a very worthy prize. It means they're not farming out their jungle. It means they're not exerting pressure on the map. It resets the tempo of V3 just a little. Yeah, but of course, this means that Yuspan's been left alone in this bot lane. And needs to be very afraid because Ryan is pretty close to level 6. Utapon now has his as well, so he could potentially help clear away this wave, but does have to lose some CS for all that play to topside. So, uh, Utapon zoned off a wave, and this is the opportunity cost for DFM, like you were saying, uh, to make that top lane play. Hollow did die earlier, not being zoned off, not capitulating anything more after that point. Turning around when the, at least he dodges out on the Chompers. Hollow, though, dangerous on this Jinx, even without those items built up yet. Indeed, uh, does a fairly good job. That The Chompers were well placed to make sure that mm -hmm. Utapon could couldn't just extricate himself nice and easily. Mujin's going to come through mid lane, uh, just help shove out this wave for Ace, who once again on this TF hasn't got out onto the map yet, but hasn't necessarily needed to, honestly. You know, V3 up about just shy of a thousand gold after the way I... this early lane has gone, primarily because of how Cogcog played that top lane. And what we did in our last podcast episode, which you should totally listen to, by Absolutely. the way, you can find on all of our social media, is we talked about the difference between Ace's TF, which he's only picked up during the playoffs of this year, he never played it before this split, and someone like Cyrus and DFM, who played it in summer last split. Cyrus was more the player that would just use it very aggressively, facilitate those dives and play towards his strong side lanes and use upon and, and, and Ebby. Whereas Ace prefers to use it like, I mean, if we can use the, you know, that, that uh, Greek folklore, uh, the Sword of Damocles. He uses this uh, unseen sword hanging by a thread above the throne and using the threat of the ult more than the ult itself. What that means is that DFM can't just proactively make plays towards his bot side and maybe zone off this Jinx a bit more. They can't necessarily try and bail out Ebby from this uh, matchup he's been bullied around in a bit more because Ace is just 
you know, playing around the fringe, playing around the fog of war, and keeping that ult available. And Utapon just being left in this 1v2 in the bot lane is losing some CS as a result, but it's basically so DFM can start up this Herald. Utapon face is breaker. Here, but that's a big face break into the Encore. That will be a lot of damage back. Kazu gets that one onto Mujin, who's just deleted. Showstopper backwards to buy space. Cog Cog left alone now. Needs to try and find his way out, but there's a lot of damage. On Sword of Shadow through an Aria gets that one. It's two already. The fear buys time. Ace has just not got damage. A double for the Seraphine. It's two hits back to back. You can call that a top ten. Hell, it'll be a number one in the LGL at this rate. <laughs> And they are reprising what they did in both of their Seraphine games. One versus the Hawks, one versus Burning Core. When Arya played this, the first Herald against the uh, the Seraphine ultimate is so disgusting to play against. The amount of CC and the utility you get early into the game is just too much to deal with. Going immediately into that replay, Zara is pushing in in that mid lane. You just see that when you don't have the Jinx in, you don't have that threat the put of the pop off coming through. V3 don't have the muscle to deal with this grouped up team of DFM, particularly because that Seraphine is already at a point of power when you have this level 6 mark. Oh boy, yeah, that's what you call a music video. Seraphine just dropping the hits everywhere there. That was stunning stuff, and DFM find themselves with a thousand gold lead after that series of plays. They have seeded some wow. pressure in the side lanes. I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, punk music, you know, but I don't think it's looking like a green day. Although DFM are making it look like they are going to send V3 on holiday down oh, that oh, boulevard no. of broken playoff dreams. Don't you oh. boo me, production. I, you know I'm right. <laughs> It's DFM, huge fight around that Herald. Like I said, it's happened so many times when they played that Seraphine mid. Well, I'm sure a lot of our international fans will be telling us to wake them up when September ends to see when Worlds comes around and what LJL representative will be out there. It's April. It's <laughs> April. It's not even a huge <laughs> I mean, maybe when, like, summer playoffs come around, you oh. can talk about that. Maybe they do want to wake up after the play-ins end if it goes badly again. That's exactly what happened to both these teams, remember, in the both previous years of uh, the World Championship. But DFM looking strong in this game yet again. V3, for, for the first time, really, in this series, will need to look to win against this early lead from DFM. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Cloud Drake is still alive. No one has taken it early on into the game, and DFM honestly don't care right now. They have a Herald, and they are very willing to start getting something out of it. Arya finds himself a second plate in mid. He is so disgustingly strong on Seraphim. And DFM have two minutes left to choose where do they want to put this Herald. They have a choice to put it, you know, maybe into bot lane, get some more mm -hmm. gold onto Utes Pony's built up that Essence Reaver, and try and zone off Hollow a bit more as well. Dragon has spawned first one of the game. Cloud Dragon, a lot of important ultimates in this game, so you probably want to be angling towards that as both of these teams looks like Steel is going to maybe put that down mid as the old counterweight while Ebby is pushing out the top lane. Utapon has got himself an Essence Reaver complete. Oh, There's nothing complete for Hollow right now aside from the boots which is nice but it does put him in a difficult position for this dragon fight. So V3 not angling towards it right now. Ebby is in a position to maybe a cancel Line cop teleport but he's recalling maybe going to teleport from base. There's the teleport in from behind. Steel avoids the solar flare but he's in danger and that will be Steel. the dragon secured but the encore comes through. Mujin needs to flash out but it's Reiner. Oh! Let's go! That's what you call us onslaught of shadows! Ezreal gets two. Concord gets one back but he has to run for the hills. Hollow is excited but only for face his own demise. Aria flashing forward, looking to get some more. The stage presence is there. Unipon gets it. Ebby is another one of those giant monsters in your nightmares. I mean, it's a, do you want an encore? Do you want more? Rocking out around that dragon. DFM have taken both of the early fights. They do lose the early dragon. But it's one dragon. It's not like you're getting too early. It's not like V3 are getting themselves a game-breaking advantage. It's just 10 ultimate haste at the end of the day. Is that worth it? Is it worth giving that gold over to the scaling carries of DFM? I don't think it is. And that wombo combo was goddamn sick. Let's be real. It was beautiful to behold. This replay just shows it. Exquisite stuff from the So <laughs> this ward, which Co which Cogcog teleports to, and the one which Ebony teleports to, are both unseen. So both teleporters have the angles that they want. Hollow and Ace, though, well, I mean, if it, they didn't have it in previous games, oh. this time they just don't have all of their angles covered. Utah Pond free firing, and Olaf flashes out the pit. Hollow and Ace just do not have that same level of safety, though. Ebby with a monstrous teleport on the monstrous champion. The rupture rends them all, 
and they are left broken in the river. It is a now uh, 2,000 plus gold lead. Now with the plates going down as well, they get a little bit, actually, I think, actually, the that plates was are off, so it's not going to be extra plate gold, but it's still a lot of chunk damage on that mid lane out of turret. Something which Josh was oh, talking hollow. before we even came into this was saying, DFM really good at getting chip damage onto towers compared to other teams, even across Global League of Legends. They are going to lose themselves this top lane out of turret, but they are getting themselves bits and pieces around the map they can play around they have themselves a gold lead they have themselves the gold in the right places too uh, there's a lot of very low towers for dfm to take at some point but that gold is not in inventory yet and it does at least for now narrow the gold lead somewhat hollow was zoned away from the wave a little there but does now get access to it that mid lane tower is a stiff breeze away from being knocked over Medjice again uh, but then, but think about this. Where is your backline axis for V3? You're looking at a solar flare, and you're looking at Volibear jumping in. Volibear at this point is not going to threaten the backline enough since Arya has the items available. And of course, Ezreal is so slippery with the cleanse too to really shut down these carries. It's much like Janna in Season 4. You just get the Magi's because, well, why not? The gold value of each kill and you're not is going to be so high, and you're unlikely to lose those stacks. We call it the Death Note over here because all of those names in that book are just your demise. And it gets worse because, of course, it's Arya. All <laughs> he just doesn't lose those stacks. He's barely died this series, and I know you want to... I know... You guys want the signatures from the pop star in mid lane, but I don't think you want her to be signing them. <laughs> Maybe not this time. It's all according to Keikaku. To, uh, translates <laughs> no, Keikaku means plan from the side of DFM. They have themselves their death ball, which seems a lot more effective than the death ball which V3 had in their first game composition because they actually have engaged. They can rely on ruptures, onslaughts of shadows, the encore itself, and of course, Kazu's high risk, high reward set. Ebby, Ebby's though, in trouble. In very high risky situation. He will find himself CC'd into his doom. He dies there. The dinosaur is down, and that will be uh, V3 looking to shove onto this in inner turret in bot lane. That'll be their third tower of the game, and that's not a bad little bit of gold going their no, way. No, it's Good not pick awful. Off. It's not awful. They get themselves that bot lane in a turret, which is often seen as the luxury turret. Well, no, that's more like the top lane in a turret, really. But, but what you really want to do is then return to the scene of that crime and threaten that bot lane in here to with a winning matchup. Problem is, when you have someone like um, a Hecarim, and of course someone like uh, the Seraphine 2, which rotate around the map so quickly with move speed increases, it's just very hard to push in and really chip down that turret. I'm not expecting V3 to really get that inhibitor turret at some point, although the gold they get from that turret right now is certainly nice to just stem the bleeding a little more. And brings the gold lead roughly back to even. The problem is that this Seraphine and this, uh, this Ezreal are just a long way ahead of their counterparts. They're, they're, they've got the damage they need in droves, whereas the front line of DFM, they can be a little behind. They don't care that much. They can do their job with the items they've got right now. And the moment DFM take those turrets, and honestly, this is a comp that was supposed to come online at two items. When Hecarim has that second item in, when Seraphine gets the Staff of Flowing Water in, second aura Putrefire in, when Ezreal gets his Muramana transformation, they shouldn't be this far ahead at this point in the game, especially not though still the pick. And Mujin might try and turn it around, but I don't uh, think he can step forward and take this wrong. fight. Kazu's got himself a fair amount of damage taken. There needs to flash away. The Mega Death Rocket misses. Cog Cog takes a lot of damage on the wall from Utapon, who stacks up his Conqueror, just autoing over the wall. Does. So Kazu loses the flash, threatening the gold card. DFM didn't have Ebi in position to you. Again, split up the composition. It's not like you've got, you know, the same amount of displacement that uh, DFM had in game one. We can just chuck out the Gragas cask or uh, what the you know, other, well, that was in game two, rather. Uh, you don't have that same amount of ability to really just split the team as things come out, but you still have yourself that Shogath rupture to slow down the backline if they are trying to capitalize upon an opportunistic <clears throat> engage from V3. Because Ebi wasn't there. Kazu has to flash out. It is something to take away from DFM from the side of E3. They're going to lose their bot lane out of turret, though. They're going to have this grouped up stack of DFM to deal with. This could be a double tower push. I'm going to try and look for it, certainly. That's going to bring a bit more of that gold lead. It's second tower of the game for DFM. They got the mid lane tower as well while that was all going they on. It's going to fall teleport, teleport in. in. That's always bad news. This team was supposed to find picks, find the man advantage with the Twisted Fate. They certainly haven't found it right now. They're in a very challenging position. Herald gets its second charge. They're down that summoner. I don't think you want to face the death ball of DFM right now. Every time that rupture lands, I'm like, hmm, 
Wonder if they can follow up on that. Ace uses the ult to go back to mid lane, not choosing to engage in any kind of play here. And I think that's the right decision. You just use your solar flare, but because he's in mid, DFM say, well, if you're not going to engage on us anyway, we can free hit this turret. We have the range advantage, and you've just blown your engage tool. And Ace needs to think about getting back here, unless they can clear out this wave, because I think DFM could look for this turret potentially. Ebby's stepping forward, but he's so tanky. Sky Splitter cleared the wave, so it is going to at least be some wave clear coming in from Cog Cog. It's a tower and a half for one right now. DFM on the Good retreat. Clear the Gonna clear out the wave similarly across the map. Good uh, good old Utapon taking uh, the cannon gold at least for that. Not losing that one to tower. Ace still kind of feels like he traded down with that play, but it is still something for V3 and taking a mid out of turret is always valuable. Yeah, I see you take that trade. I think perhaps it was a little greedy from DFM to continue on to that inhibitor. I know they want to try and force Ace into an awkward recall so they didn't get anything, but you're not on Baron, you don't really have enough of a wave there to continue on, and maybe just a little too over-eager from DFM. Maybe just a bit. DFM, get their reset, spend that hard-earned gold. The gold lead is not blown out of proportion just yet. What's going to be really awkward, though, is that now you've got a Muramana coming in with just one more stack for you to pawn. What you really need from V3 now is to get that first pick. You get that, you get excited. Doesn't matter that your Jinx is 0 and 2, they still have themselves a CS advantage, still have themselves two items at this point as well. That's what DFM are really wary of. Look for that lack of discipline in DFM, which occasionally they've had. Kazu has occasionally gone too deep, Ebby caught out in side lanes. If that happens and some DFM members are nearby, expect the follow-up engage to be deadly from V3. They are still in this game. This is the least stompy game we've had so far. And in the decided, well, at championship point, it's probably good for V3 in their side of things because, you know, they did have that early game deficit from DSM to fa um, DFM to uh, to face off against. I'm fairly sure there's a fairly famous singer-songwriter song that goes a little like rolling in the deep. <laughs> and when you've got a Seraphine at 2-0-6 with three items completed in with one He's of those... rolling in money at that point. Med, uh, with, uh, with, three of the, with one of those items being a Medjize at 10 stacks. Uh, I think DFM might be happy to roll with that. Cog Cog's on the flank, but so is Kazu. Uh, Ebi might be finding himself out a little outnumbered around his... He's not even gotten in a tier 2, of course, because that got taken down earlier. So maybe V3 could yeah. look to find out the dinosaur, so, but um, not going to happen yet. So important things to know, this is patch 11.5, and we do have that means uh, if you cast spells, the high note passive from... Um, well, sorry, the, 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 stage the passive for, for the stage presence from, from the Seraphine actually gives you that Staff of Flowing Water Moonstone ability keeps oh, rocking. Boy. The move speed from Staff of Flowing oh, Water is too much. Back. He's just getting pulled back. Reiner could not be there. He's going to get knocked out. The Staff of Flowing Water plus a knuckle down. And a dead Gets a kill. I was literally just about to touch onto that. Kazuyu has so much movement speed. The auras, the buffs, the staff, the staff of flowing water, and the dead man's is too much. And DFM, start the Baron. They definitely do. Ebby's got teleport isn't over yet. He's going to come into the mid lane and look for a flank instead. They've got, of course, all of the healing. The onslaught of shadows come through, force the flash away from Ace. But he's got to be afraid first behind. Here comes Godzilla. There's no Kong to make your day a little bit easier this time. The kaiju come through. Feast yet to be used. The rupture won't stop Cog Cog, but they've got to already steal devastating charges into a honey fruit because he's a hungry, hungry hippo. He still uh, cut them off at the pass. I mean, Hollow is alive. Yeah, he has damage, but he just has his Olaf waiting for him. Oh. This is almost surely going to be two extra kills coming from DFM. He still needs to be a little wary, though. He could fall down here. Gonna die shoved away. Hollow doesn't quite find it, and he's now out of mana. Gets dropped into the base here. He flashed in for that, by the way. He's gonna try to outplay and instead suffers for it. Mujin goes down as well. Here comes Cog Cog, but he doesn't want to, he's going to try to execute on the base. Uh, but it is Seraphine who gets that kill. Teleport in, back towards the Baron. And with all those members dying to V3, who just constantly keep finding fights, but you can't win these! Reiner finally uses his summoner spell and gets away, but with the jungler dead, with Hollow dead, and Cog Cog at half HP, DFM return to the scene of the crime and will start up Baron again at 23 minutes. It's a good scrap from both teams. If Hollow had killed Steel they can't take the Baron, but because he loses his life, doesn't get anything onto Steel either. V3, once again in the series, have desynchronized death timers. They don't have themselves the smite available because Mujin dies to Utapon on the side as well. DFM, break the spine of this game. And it's a top 20 for Arya. 20 stacks indeed on the Magi's 407. Ezreal at well, now it's six kills. Let's have a look over this replay because it just starts off Reinhardt. Seemingly too far forwards. 
I mean, this is exactly what we kind of touched on just as it happened. Look at the amount of move speed just it's available nuts. to this team. Kazuya has a fully stacked. I mean, Reiner has himself boots. He's not a slow champion. It's just not enough. The wave comes in. That's the real problem here. The fact that uh, he does get stunned on the minions. I think you have to flash out early just to deny that face breaker. Doesn't come in in time, though. And then the it's extra picture. <laughs> there, we took the dragon. They're looking for the fight afterwards. The solar fair and the flame chompers do stop that one coming through. No mega death rockets available anymore for Hollow to try and get the kill onto a low health uh, Kazu. And Cogcore -Cog clears the wave. That'll be second Drake for DFM, but it is yeah. kind of stalling up the Baron points because FIFA is playing multiple lanes. It is. DFM don't have themselves soul point. Ace is just saying, well, yeah, screw the fight. We're not going to win that one anyway. Let's try and get something across the board. Push out the waves. He's going to ult out. He is in safety now. He has D pushed that top wave. DFM, they do have themselves two minutes of Baron buff remaining, but they're not even going to get you. I'm not even sure they're going to get a single turret from it now. Potentially not. They got the dragon, but I think V3 did a very good job to prevent DFM from getting too much. They're but using the Twisted Fate to get as much on the uh, where DFM or not as possible. But this is one of the persisting problems of the LJL, which we see a little bit of a, a reverse of in this game, right? Most teams in the LJL just really don't like playing a wide map. They don't like spreading things across places. But this game, V3 realized after they've lost a couple of those team fights, ah, we probably can't take the 5v5. Ace at least gets something for his team. The wave is still alive. There's a minute left of Baron buff. I was wrong. That's an inner turret in mid lane. Probably inhibitor turret to follow. Ace is in the bot lane. He's got teleport. He may need to burn it soon, though, because these towers are not long for the world. In goes Kazu into the back lane. Hollow is slowed. The onslaught of shadow is there. There is no Tom Kent this time. And the Jinx is dead. She is destroyed, deleted, devastated RV3. Their base is now in shambles as well. DFM ain't done. Cog Cog pulled out of his attempted oh. escape. Unipon gets that one. 7 0 2 for the man with the gauntlet. The gauntlet was thrown. The encore is there. And that might be exactly what it is. It's a repeat. Of of game two as DFM run this one over. They're looking to end it in sub 27. That they are DFM champions once again. V3 Esports, the reigning champions, seed their crown. Detonation Focus Me with a coach for a support with a new mid laner for the first time in years are your LJL champions in 2021 spring. They'll be heading towards MSI with their revamped roster. We will see Noceros and Gang in this series. Kazu and Arya were enough to put this game and this series to bed. We were just, you know, <laughs> trying to praise V3 for, okay, they understand they can't take the fight. Maybe they're trying to play things a bit wider, go for that split push. It was too little, it was too late. They didn't roll over the early game like they did in that soul victory. No more attack of the cloned wins for them. Just sat <laughs> of that one. V1 and 3 on the day. DFM though, I think they're worthy champions. They are worthy champions indeed. V3, put a bit of a fight. Ace tried to play defensively as best as he could from behind the scenes, split pushing until DFM to say, screw it. We gather in mid, we use the Baron, we've earned ourselves after a ridiculous series of play, catching Reiner out and then moving on from there, and they take the whole series. Congratulations to Detonation Focus Me, they are the worthy champions. Commiserations to V3 who fought so hard to recover from their end of split. Difficulties fought the way all the way from round one in the lower bracket to the finals. They fall today despite expectations, mm. of course, that they would fall way earlier. They should feel proud considering the roster they have. Yeah. And honestly, I mean, from, from a personal perspective, you know, that means split's over now for us. Mm. We see DFM raise the trophy once more. Uh, we followed them now for a year and a half. Uh, you know, on our unofficial stream, we got together as, uh, you know, us two and Mass One, who again, we do we do hope he has a swift recovery. Very, very uh, sad to mm. not have him on the broadcast today, but I hope we did make him proud because I'm actually proud of what we've managed to do in this split. And uh, to see all of this coverage go through and to bring this in English language to viewers like yourselves. Absolutely. And at this point, we'll bid Nymera adieu for the That's split. And we're going to go on a quick break. And when I come back, we'll have one final analyst desk with our very stalwart analyst. It's getting late over there in the States. We won't make him hang around too long. Let's go to break, Patrick.
welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm still initialized. I am joined for the last time by a stalwart crew of counterfeit who got up desperately early with Patrick, our producer, and of course, Maple Street and Joshi, who are here burning the midnight oil, although I suspect it might be a little later than that now over in the States. Thanks for staying with us. DFM are the champions. They are. It's been a long road and I thought it was really exciting that we got to see a very different version of both these teams to round mm. out the night. DFM learned from their mistakes of playing super to the late game earlier where they took a lot of meaningless fights and fell behind because of it. Whereas V3 actually made some really cool plays across the map and it probably did. didn't realize how close the game actually was in terms of gold, seeing as how far down they were in kills, but it was a refreshing take, I thought, on a lot of the things that we saw today, where DFM making all the plays, V3 just kind of reacting to them. So I did like to see that V3 were able to have more proactivity in this and Absolutely. will hopefully have a brighter future because of it. Actually, some great plays from behind. They did some good jobs splitting the map, getting some picks where they perhaps shouldn't have. That said, let's roll into this first clip, Patrick. Maple, do you want to take us through this? Because this is Kazu on the set, doing pretty well here. Yeah, Rhino overextend and they get the perfect stun. Like, to the, the Leoto sets up the stun for the set to land, and once you're behind against Ezreal, it can get, like, extremely dangerous. Ezreal just absolutely chunks people in the mid game, and with a gold lead, he's gonna keep being insane in team fights. Absolutely. Counterfeit, though. The, the, that did mean that Ebby didn't teleport back to lane after things got a bit ropey for him, and he gets proxied on, so the trade in pressure here. Your boy Cog Cog did all right at making Ebby's life difficult. Yeah, I was loving this when we saw it. I was just so, so impressed that the opportunity was seen by Cog Cog. Of course, we see, you know, there was only so long that good time could last, and ultimately it ended up going sideways eventually. But still, I like the, what V2 were trying. Absolutely. And uh, this is the dive top as well, where Cog Cog and Mugen continue to try and punish. Uh, can if you want to continue on this, and we'll throw to others after this. Yeah, I mean, well, it started so well, but, you know, the numbers eventually did tell. And I think as well, the punish keeping V3 from completing taking down that tower did eventually fall. You know, Cog Cog's work was good, but we mentioned the gold difference. And that's where a lot of it came from. And, the, and this is the bit where it all falls apart, though, isn't it, Joshi? This Herald fight, despite V3 pulling back a little, is just superb for DFM. Yeah, I know that Maple Street Counterfeit and I, before the game was over, we're just looking at it as like, I think the game is probably going to be decided at this Herald fight, right? You see DFM bringing a lot of members up. You know that now that they're past the early game, that they have their ultimates, they're going to want to start looking for these big advantages and just take fights because they think they're better. And this was a situation, Kazu gets there first as level 6, Rhyna doesn't mm -hmm. get there until a little bit too late, also doesn't have access to his ultimate yet, and this is like another one of those situations. They just move to objectives first, get these fights, and outperform their opponents, Evi and Steel coming up big in this last one. And it, it's cool to see when they are able to slow down and be like, hey, maybe we don't need to just throw everything at them. Maybe we should play with respect for our opponents and only make plays that we know are good. And I think we get to see a little bit more of that. It makes me more excited to see DFM go on to perform at MSI. And we're giving a lot of praise to DFM here, as particularly around these objectives. They were beautiful. But Maple, uh, let's give some credit to V3 as well. They managed to yep. pull back a fair amount of their lead. They get three or so turrets. They catch Ebby out around his jungle, trying to transition to the bot lane tier two. They did a good job of managing to play the map pretty wide and, and play from behind. Yeah, in terms of macro, they were up in towers for a long time. maybe half the game. And they kept the gold really close, but despite being down like 12 kills, the gold lead was only like four kills worth of gold, you know? So mm. the macro was good. Cog played really well. They adapted their drafts. And, but DFM just got the Exodia comp. They got the Seraphine plus the Hecarim. We can see that DFM is willing to play lots of different strategies. And it should be very exciting what they bring Absolutely, to MSI. Yeah. Absolutely. And then we saw the, that ridiculous extended Baron fight where Rhino gets picked and then they turn to Baron and then people get chased around and Hollow tries to take out Steel having run towards DFM's base and, and Steel survives. And it's kind of all over from there. And yes, it's a bit scrappy. Yes, it's a little bit of desperation from V3, uh, but it's already kind of sealed by that point. And I, I do think Maple's comments there about looking forward to MSI are probably the right place to take this conversation before we do sign off for the evening. 
DFM are locked in as the LJ representatives going to Reykjavik in Iceland. They will be in a group with what looks to be damn one Kia, either Team Liquid or Cloud9, and the LLA representative of well. This should be pretty exciting. Obviously, I'm not going to say, you know, DFM going to win this all. They're going to go and MSI and crush Dan Wonkia, the reigning world champions. But I'm hoping that we should have some at least some excitement. It'd be great for Aria to get some stage expression as well, right, kind of fit. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, certainly coming into this one, we knew that these were the two teams you've managed to you know, recently break out onto that international stage and try and show what the LGL was capable of. I, you know, I really hope this is a huge growth opportunity uh, for DFM to kind of you know, to go up mm. against that next tier of competition and hopefully come back, bring that experience back to the league and raise the level of competition here as well. And that's kind of where I want to take this for a little bit. The reason we said we wanted Aria in the mid lane for DFM is there is just a mechanical bar required to go to international competition. You must be this tall to ride the international roller coaster. If you cannot lane well enough, if you cannot play enough champions, as well as having a good macro sense, you won't stand a chance at getting anywhere in something like MSI. Maple, as a team that has coached, oh, as a team, as, a, as someone who has coached teams out in the LGL, there we go, English language evades me for a moment there. What would you be saying to a team like DFM who are going to the LGL if, if you were in a coaching position with them? What would you be trying to do with them going into such stiff competition group? What would you trying to learn? Um, honestly, they do get a lot of practice in Korean teams mm. and they do play like 40, 50 ping. Um, I don't know. Usually you get to test your strategies against different regions, what they think the best strategy is. So you go into scrims with an open mind and you try to determine what the best meta is for the current state of the game. And hopefully the dice sort of rolls towards what we've been practicing in Japan. And if so, I could definitely see us getting upset. That's what we like to hear. Joshi, your own thoughts on this group? Because, uh, I mean, let's think about some of these players you could be playing against. Mid laners that would be worth thinking about. Perks could be there. We know Showmaker's going to be there. That sounds pretty tasty for Aria. Liquid could still be there. That would mean we could get Alfari and Khan for Ebi to go against. Your thoughts on some of these matchups? Do you think these guys can at least contest? I... We'll see. They're going up against <laughs> some very <laughs> tough competition, right? I'm like, trying to like be a little bit optimistic. And just like, well, you're thinking about Khan, Khan, Alfari, Perk, Showmaker, some of the utmost are. best players in the world, <laughs> right? Like I've I've said for a long time, if we're willing to import Australians here in North America, we should be willing to look at some of the Japanese players. Mm. I think players like Evi, Utapone, Aria. Uh, these guys are all people that would absolutely deserve a spot on their skill alone in some of these North American rosters. But even then, it's the kind of thing where we see some of the big differences that DFM have with some of these other top teams. They're a bit more chaotic. They aren't necessarily the most controlled across the map. And I think that is something that, you know, we might see exposed uh, through this entire thing. But that, I think, is also this big blessing in disguise. This is not the final form for dfm that's coming later right when oh, gang yeah. has not opportunity to join the roster they go from the strongest roster to like oh my god who is ever going to beat this dfm roster but this is an opportunity for them to see what works what doesn't and actually be beaten by teams so that they can recognize their own mistakes and level up in time for world so i think it's no matter what going to be a worthwhile experience for them Exactly. And maybe a little bit of chaos is exactly what it takes to uh, break some of the more standard and orthodox plays that could be coming out from the LCS and LCK representatives. And you're right, it's not even DFM's final form, which is oh so scary for summer when they're winning like this in spring. I think with that, ladies and gentlemen, with our eyes turned towards MSI, we have probably got to sign off for the day. So I want to offer some massive thank you to Counterfeit to Maple Street, to Joshi, and of course to Patrick, our producer. Thank you for your time. It was an early start for us UK lads. It is a late finish for our American friends as well. So from myself, from Nymera, from the unfortunately absent Mass One, we thank you so much for sticking up with us through the spring split. We thank you again to our guests for coming on. DFM are the champions. We'll be looking forward to MSI to see how they do. We'll see you again. Woo! in summer split. Until then, see you around. Matane.